The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Market Tech Group's very special discussion about selling healthcare technology in Brazil. Here's what you need to know. So, I'm Robert Enzerink. Uh, I'm a partner and senior consultant with the Market Tech Group. Uh, we're very fortunate to welcome today um, Eric Hubbard, who's the senior director of sales and marketing for Rigaku Corporation, uh, which provides scientific equipment and consumables to the pharmaceutical and academic laboratories. Uh, Eric has spent the last 15 years working in a number of marketing and sales roles within the orthopedic and in vitro diagnostic markets, and uh, over 10 years specifically working in international markets, developing regional marketing plans and sales strategies for companies including J&J &J Depew, um, and as the International Strategic Marketing Manager for Siemens Healthcare Diagnostics. Uh, welcome, Eric. Thank you for having me. And also with us is Frederico Burul who's a board member of the Santa Casa de Sao Paulo uh, and also a partner of Burul Consultores. Uh, Fred is a specialist in Brazilian corporate finance, including private placements, M&A, uh, joint ventures, and leverage and management buyouts. Uh, Fred is a board member of Brazil's biggest nonprofit healthcare provider, the Santa Casa de Sao Paulo, um, and he conducted strategic and operational optimization projects for a number of HMOs, health management organizations, including Grupo São Francisco and Uniao Saúde, and healthcare providers, hospitals, clinics, and primary care centers. Welcome, Fred. Thank you, Robert, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Now, many of our guests have submitted questions to the Market Tech Group prior to today's discussion, and we've tried to incorporate these into our discussion where possible. Uh, so some of the questions that I'll pose to you guys will come from our audience. Um, also, to the audience, uh, as you hear thought-provoking comments from Mr. Hubbard and Barul, uh, we encourage you to text questions into the webinar question box that should be up on your screen, and we'll address as many of them as we can during today's discussion, um, either during the discussion or afterwards. Uh, with respect for everyone's time, uh, let's get started. A little bit of background on uh, the USA and Brazil. Um, the U.S., of course, folks are interested in Brazil because it's a, a large and growing market. It's about two-thirds the size of the U.S. in terms of population, uh, with a GDP of about two trillion U.S. dollars. Uh, their healthcare spending is about 185 billion compared to three trillion in the U.S., but it too is getting a high part of GDP, about nine percent. So there's no wonder that people are interested in this market. You know why Brazil? Um, Eighty-nine and a half percent of folks rate Brazil as the one of the top ten emerging markets. Um, how healthcare in Brazil and the U.S. compares, um, there are a lot of hospitals in Brazil. Um, of the 7,500 hospitals in Brazil, uh, almost 5,000 of them are public. An interesting situation in Brazil is that there are a number of very, very large hospitals located in the large cities. Uh, Sao Paulo and Rio, uh, and then many, many small hospitals, some of which as small as five or six beds in many of the rural areas. So a high number of hospitals, um, and yet about half as many beds as in the U.S. Um, there's some information on the amount of spending. Again, the U.S. spends a lot more dollars, but Brazil is certainly nothing to uh, sneeze at, which is why many of our attendees and their companies are interested in the Brazilian market. There's also a significant amount of growth. So Referring to those demographics that we just reviewed and, and what you know about Brazil, um, other than significant growth, uh, maybe Fred, you can start us out with you know the key changes or trends you see that are occurring, specifically impacting healthcare and the medical technology industry in Brazil. Sure. Uh, well, uh, basically, uh, the healthcare system here in Brazil, we have. Uh, public coverage uh, of, of everyone. As, as we say here, it's uh, uh, something that the government gives to everyone, but uh, it, it, it has not a lot of, of quality. So uh, we have the private sector coming in with HMOs and health insurance companies, and, and, and here we see uh, a new wave of, of Healthcare expenditures. Uh, we are a poor country here, but uh, slowly we are getting better. 
and healthcare is our main priority today. So we we will have a significant increase both in public expenditure and also uh, private expen uh, expenditure. The population is aging. Uh, the private coverage will today it's around 50 million people and it it will grow uh, to around uh, 60 to, to 65 million uh, in around four four to five years uh, there are many new new jobs being being created uh, around 1 million per year and everyone is going into the private sector. So uh, we have a lot of people uh, having awareness of uh, what the healthcare system could offer them. Great. Eric, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I, I certainly agree with what uh, Fred was stating in regards to the public coverage situation. It is, uh, it is something that they're definitely focusing on. But as he mentioned, there's strong demand there. So with the demand, it's, it's difficult to really fund across that, that demand. So the quality is something that is being continually looked at. Private is, I, I, would, I would see private almost becoming, I wouldn't be surprised if it became half of the overall uh, health care. Uh, in regards to uh, coverage, and uh, private insurance really wasn't that regulated well in the past, but I know it's definitely becoming more and more regulated now, and becoming far more in line. And I don't know if Fred would agree with this or not, but it seems like it's coming more in line with some of the U.S. activities. Although, as Fred had mentioned, they have more of a mandated uh, free coverage, and we don't. Well. Technically, we do with Obamacare, but we're not really sure where that stands right now. And certainly but, not today. <laughs> no, not today. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I see Brazil and and the U.S. with with many similarities in, in terms of where Brazil is is wanting to go. Uh, a lot of my you mentioned trends. You know, from my perspective, I come at it a little bit differently now because I'm not just within the healthcare, but most recently within scientific research, pharma, and I can tell you. You know what you need to know when it comes to Brazil. If if you're a multinational organization, you're you're going to do business in Brazil. It is the largest uh, anchor in Latin America and the strongest economy. And I can say that recently they've been funding a lot of efforts in uh, pharma, scientific research, building informatics to tie this all together. And uh, for some reason, which I haven't figured out yet, uh, regionally they're putting about 30% of this effort into the uh, northern part of their of their country. But when you look at like the Brazilian uh, Ministry of Science, I know that they've been putting 200 million dollars recently in, in nanotechnologies and and other interesting scientific research like this. Uh, there are some research foundations that are putting six to 700 million in a, a dozen of different uh, centers. Uh, across the country over the next 10 years focusing on inflammatory diseases, uh, drug discovery, uh, cell, cell, cell therapy signaling. So there's a lot of, you know, you can see this activity in Brazil from the government, from the agencies to really push Brazil to that next level and uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of growth and support there for it. Yeah. So uh, interestingly, with with what you said about the public coverage, and, and we've seen uh, similar information about the the high uh, percentage of care, but maybe the, the low quality of care. Uh, Fred, when we spoke with you earlier, you presented some interesting perspectives on the percent of the population that's covered and uh, the public versus private expenditure. Can you explain that a little bit to our audience? Sure. Uh, basically, today we have uh, uh, regarding the coverage, 25% 20, of our of our population is covered by private uh, uh, healthcare system. Uh, so it's around 50 million people. The other 150 million, they're 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 covered by the public system. Uh, uh, if we, on the other hand, uh, analyze the 
expenditure. Uh, the public sector does only expend uh, $80 billion, U.S. dollars, every year, and the private sector, $105 billion. So uh, the, the quality of the private sector services is much greater uh, than, than the public sector, right? Uh, basically, we invest uh, more and the, cov the coverage is for a lower percentage of, of the population. This, this can be a huge opportunity because uh, the 75 percent, and I totally agree with, with uh, Eric's remarks, I think uh, today the dream of, of everyone who, who is not covered by the private system is to go into the private system. Uh, so uh, it's all a question of adjustment and, and, and price of this coverage and uh, people will flock to the private system. Yeah. So Eric, from your perspective as someone who's been uh, involved very much in the marketing and sales in Brazil, can you briefly explain to us how this, the healthcare payer system, the, the unified health system, the SUS, works in Brazil and, and how it impacts selling uh, to hospitals and labs uh, in Brazil? Well, I, I may not have the, uh, let's say, the same internal knowledge of the, of the payer system as maybe as much as here in the United States. I, I can say that just I can talk about my experiences and, and some of the unique things that I came across, and, and part of that is, is more on the tendering process. So for organizations that are selling uh, equipment or selling other devices that, that run through a tender process, one of the unique things that I noticed is they have a very, for the lack of another term, eBay-like uh, format called a reverse option tender. It's sort of their method uh, of running through and, and winning tenders. Uh, and again, this is specific to those companies that would have products that would fall under a tender process. So I can, expl I can explain it and speak to that more intelligently. And the, the issue there is that these competitors and yourselves place your bids online, you're not really sure when the bidding process is, is going to end. Uh, it's sort of a random timing process, uh, as our distributors would tell us. So you're encouraged essentially to put in the lowest price possible as soon as possible. And, and that's by design. So what it's doing is it's driving prices down pretty hard. And there's a lot, a lot of talk when you're in the process, and this is not unique to Brazil. You want to be ahead of the tender process as early as possible. But for Brazil, there is talk of quality, but in the end, they really do focus on price, unless, of course, you have the only game in town, and you do have a unique position uh, that pales uh, where other comparisons you know, would, would pale. Otherwise, it, it's, it's on price. Now, I will tell you this, uh, just because another competitor does not meet the specs doesn't mean they won't still put in a low price on the bidding uh, process just to mess with you. Uh, they eventually get disqualified, but it ties up the process, and it actually happens more often than you'd think. So these distributors have to deal with that in, in understanding that at times, many times, they're going to be uh, dealing with competitors who don't truly meet the spec, but they're still going to throw in lowball prices. Of course, you can avoid these processes on some government back tenders and most private tenders, but you do need strong documentation of what I call sole sourcing. So if you have sole sourcing, that really makes you stand out as a unique uh, uh, product compared to the competition. You can avoid uh, some of these um, reverse option tenders. Yeah. So how does a company establish themselves as a sole source? Does it have to be a very clear, obvious box around your product where you have IP, or can you differentiate on, on small nuances? Well, it's interesting to mention IP because I know that's still an ongoing. I don't know, uh, Fred, if it's different now. It's been a few years with some of the IP I've dealt with in Brazil. But I know that that's that's a bit tough to to uh, defend. There's a lot of agency red tape still in terms of getting IP understood within Brazil. So uh, that's one of the things that does slow down some of the R&D efforts Brazil wants to uh, incentivize pharma to do as opposed to just straight manufacturing. But when it comes down to the unique position, it does depend on the uh, 
the true nature of your box and how you define it. If you can get your customer to make a case that there really is no other way in which they can take care of their business, day-to-day -day business, without this particular unique feature, then that does allow them that argument to move out of it. But maybe Fred has a, a more uh, internalized position on it. That's what I see and what I deal with through my distributors uh, in Brazil. Yeah, um, uh, I can I can tell you about my experience at at Santa Casa. Uh, we are uh, the biggest uh, government provider, uh, and basically we we can. Uh, Many of our our investments, uh, we have we we have a bidding process, uh, which is always overseen by the government. Uh, so uh, basically, it's a way that the government can uh, uh, lead the the bidding pro process because uh, this this continues to be very tight, as Eric. Uh, said uh, before, so um, a close relationship, uh, a local relationship is very important, including uh, a close relationship with uh, government agencies and uh, uh, Ministry of Health. Uh, this is very important so that we can uh, we can take this uh, uh, to 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 the highest level because uh, it's it's very difficult to buy something without the permission uh, of the of of the government authorities. Uh, regarding the private sector, uh, I think uh, it's easier. But then again, uh, to have a local relationship for them, for them to know the uh, uh, local HMOs and and health insurance companies, mm -hmm. this this would be very important for for the bidding process. Uh, yeah, interesting. I, Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I definitely agree having that relationship and that's that's why we would enter in with, with strong distributorships who have those strong partnerships and, and relationships. They understand not just the tender process I described, but they understand a lot of the ins and outs of, of the uh, Brazilian healthcare system. Uh, I don't know if that's you know specifically unique to Brazil, but it's definitely uh, something that you want to keep in mind. Uh, as you're jumping into a growing market like like Brazil, uh, there are unique situations like I was mentioning the tender process. Of course, you're going to want to ensure if you are dealing with FDA approved products that uh, uh, your relationship, your distributor, is approved and registered locally for handling those products, and that's always an, an, an obvious. Yeah. So you, you bring up an interesting point, Eric. That the regulatory considerations, really briefly, in Europe. Uh, Manufacturer needs to get it to the EMARC. In Japan, they need to get Ministry of Health and Welfare application in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, FDA clearance via 510K or PMA. Um, sure. Really high level. What's the process in Brazil, and, and how costly and how long does it take relative to those uh, applications and approvals? Well, they do have a, a, an, an organization that does follow closely with the FDA and, and I would say, CE mark type processes. You know, from my perspective, going and we have always had a uh, local, uh, we always had a U.S. Uh, corporate agency that would work with the local agencies in Brazil, but you always had to have your 510K, let's say, registration in hand or CE mark. I mean, that was a given when you start the process. The thing for me, and, the, and, and I guess my perspective on the regulatory, is more about product planning. Because it, we've had products, and I don't know, depending on what company's products look like, we would have updates that would have to occur almost on a yearly basis with software and consumables. And so if you can imagine the time it takes for the 510K, one has to realize going into Brazil, it could take nine months, it could take 12 months, it could take quite a bit of time, and this is beyond the point when which you already received your FDA approval. So that has to be put into the uh, 
into the works when you're trying to plan product releases and understand when Brazil is going to receive products uh, for distribution for yeah. sale. So would you say there are advantages to introducing first in another market like the U.S. or Europe? Well, I, I believe that is the case, correct. Now, what Brazil is trying to do, at least from the pharma perspective, is pharmaceuticals have already been there. Uh, this is not a, a recent trend that they have been building uh, manufacturing within the, uh, the country, but they're trying to push more activity on R&D development, clinical trials, for example. There's a lot of foreign incentive to have foreign business not just manufacture but do the R&D. Now, besides the IP situation we described, uh, they have been pushing this, and clinical trials have been increasing over the last 10 years in Brazil. Then the only issue is that if you think the FDA, I'm sorry, if you think clinical trials in the U.S. take a long time to get patients built in, it, it takes even longer in Brazil. They're, they're working on that, I understand. But uh, right now, that's the, the biggest hurdle for them. But they is it because of enrollment? Pushing. Difficulty getting enrollment? Or follow? It's, part, it's partly enrollment. It's not so much fault. It's just the, the agencies and the red tape. But understand, they've got a very good process in place. Uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not a pharmaceutical manufacturer. I work with pharmaceuticals, so I, I hear this through those pharma, pharma reps who are my, my customers. Yeah. And this is what they're telling me. They're telling me that there is, there is a number of, of pieces of red tape to go through the process, but that's just to make sure that the, the clinical trials are um, well thought through and that it protects the patient in the end. Yeah. Got it. So a quick summary of what we've, we've looked at so far. Um, it, it seems that the, uh, the SUS process has, has managed to improve access to primary and emergency care, but there's a question about the, the quality of that care. So some of the pros and cons uh, that we summarize, it sounds like that's supported based on your on-the-ground experience, uh, Fred and Eric. Um, everyone has a right to health care. It's a, it's a, um, a policy. Uh, decision in Brazil. However, the the system is still largely decentralized. It's not particularly efficient at delivering service. There are some regulatory uh, hurdles. Um, family physicians reach only about one of two Brazilians, and and the system is a little bit underfunded. However, there seems to be a trend that the that the Brazilian government is is spending more. Now, let's uh, change our discussion a little bit more to. The challenges that companies encounter, specifically when trying to enter the Brazilian market, um, and and who those stakeholders are. Clearly, there's a distinction between the public and private um, hospitals, um, and and there's a large difference in terms of the dollars available in each of those markets. Can you to help us identify who the actual healthcare buyers are in the Brazilian hospitals the, and the clinical and diagnostic labs? We talked about the tender process. You know, how centralized are these decisions? Fred, maybe starting with you from the, the public perspective. Sure. Uh, I would say that uh, looking at uh, the private sector, which is uh, maybe the, um, the sector who, who will, will buy uh, the most from, uh, from diagnostics, uh, equipment, I would say that uh, it's, it's, it's really cent centralized. Uh, they have a, uh, a procurement uh, uh, over HMO, they have a procurement uh, department, and they work very, very closely to the industry. Uh, cost for them is a uh, uh, is a very important uh, component of their results, of their final results. So they are very, they are very, they take this uh, to great importance. Uh, private, private hospitals, on the other hand, uh, are very cost-driven and relationship-driven. Uh, so. I would say they're, they're, uh, it's more decentralized, uh, their uh, procurement process, uh, and definitely the, the public sector uh, 
we have we have here three uh, uh, orbits of of government. So we have the municipal, the state, and the federal government. Uh, the federal government, I I would say that they they would have eighty percent of the of the uh, expenditure on the public service, uh, and so and they work very very closely to the municipal government. So it's fairly decentralized, uh, but then again, uh, the federal government and the agencies uh, will establish some routines and some, uh, and they will work closely with the municipal government. That is, that would be decentralized. So uh, for like a, Equipment company coming into into Brazil and and selling to the public sector, they would need to have a huge uh, selling force, uh, very very decentralized, all all around the country. Uh, I would say for the HMOs and uh, health insurance companies, uh, it would be easier, a smaller uh, sales force. Uh, mainly in Sao Paulo and Rio. Yeah, Eric, how does that match with your experience in in putting together a, a distribution network to cover the country? Well, I I agree. I, I would say you, you're certainly going to be uh, dealing with Sao Paulo. You're going to be dealing with Rio and, and some of these regions, coastal regions, of course, in Brasilia as well. We were um, we had relationships and, and offices there. So, absolutely, you're. You want to make sure you have the distribution relationship to cover that region. It, there, there's a lot of people forget how large Brazil is as a country. It's it's a pretty large country, and there's a lot of rural areas. And I don't know, Fred, if this is still happening today, but I do know uh, I've heard the stories where there are a lot of doctors actually imported from other countries like Cuba or Bolivia or other Spanish-speaking countries because a number of Brazilian doctors don't even want to travel and work to some of these remote locations because they're so out of the, the way. And Again, I don't know if that's still happening today, but uh, yeah. this is, it does. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so if you're going to give guidance to a company, let's say first uh, a fairly small company, um, what would be the, tar the key target for them to start introducing some products into Brazil? Would you recommend that they go after the public or the private sector? And who do they target? Uh, who are the individuals that they should focus their energies on if they can't build that huge distribution network that you mentioned, Fred? Uh, well, I'll say that uh, they should focus in uh, HMOs and uh, some private hospitals, uh, mainly because they can acknowledge uh, the quality and the, and the service and uh, differentiations of the equipment uh, because today also here in Brazil we are we are being flooded with uh, Asian uh, equipment uh, they don't have uh, many local dealers uh, Maintenance is a problem, and I say this because uh, the, our, our institution just bought some uh, equipment from a Chinese manufacturer, and we had just a huge problem uh, from manuals uh, to maintenance, but then again, they just uh, changed uh, the equipment, but uh, we will probably not buy from them anymore. So uh, we we are starting to uh, acknowledge that quality and uh, service. Uh, we are willing to pay uh, a premium for service and quality as well. So I would say that focus in uh, some. Uh, HMOs and some hospitals and some clinics in Sao Paulo, Rio, they said Brasilia as well. Uh, 
south of Brazil, Porto Alegre, uh, and make a, uh, establish a close relationship to these clients. Uh, I think they would be willing uh, to 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 pay a premium and establish a long-term relationship with uh, with smaller companies. Yeah. Now let, let's talk about the other side of that coin for the larger companies. Um, if a company is looking to uh, really grow their distribution in Brazil, what are the advantages of working with a local, uh, on the ground, existing distributor? distributor or, or distribution network versus setting up their own distribution network or growing their own distribution network? Uh, yeah, are you asking me, Robert? Uh, either one of you that has a perspective on that. Well, well, I think it comes down to the individual business plan. I mean, depending upon the volume and the, and the scope and the size of the product line coming in, uh, I think most would say, yeah, sure, a direct sales channel would, would help. Um, alleviate costs, but then you, you're far more invested in that uh, in that venture. And, and as I said, you know, farmers have already done this. Farmers have made this move now. Uh, what you'll see is you'll see a lot of, of people begin the relationship with uh, very good distributorships who have, as as Fred was pointing out, a very good understanding and a good um, service model as well. I, I can't agree more that. If you really want to beat out the competition, Brazil, have strong service. Don't even bother going in unless you've got a service that can really make you stand out because that's part of the equation, if not the most important part of, of the equation. And uh, we used to really focus on distributors who had the ability to offer uh, a very good service. So, you know, there's that aspect of it. But there's also a mid piece. It, it, one of the things I want to bring up that I found uh, surprising when I first started working in Brazil are just the amount of tariffs and taxes that are uh, added to the products coming in where you'll talk to a distributor and they say listen I take your price I multiply by the exchange rate and then I multiply it again by 2.2 .2 just to get a final customer price because I have to cover all these tariffs and taxes and it is amazing how much that stacks up on the value of the product coming in to the point where uh, those customer or some companies coming in, if they have products that can be brought in as subcomponents, unassembled, you'll see that happening more and more where companies are taking subcomponents, bringing them in. It greatly reduces their tariff and tax. They can become more competitive and they have the margin room to now just have them simply assembled within a facility somewhere, sometimes with a distributor if they have the, the resource. And they just build it up within Brazil and then they sell it. So that has yeah, to do with, totally go ahead, Fred. Yeah, 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 I totally agree. Um, in many cases, uh, you can come here just to fill the market. You can work with a local distributor. Uh, as Eric said, yeah, you can assemble things here. Uh, and then if you feel more and more comfortable, then you can, you can even uh, uh, set something down here. So, so if I'm hearing you right, there are some policy benefits to doing part of your assembly or packaging, some part of your, uh, your, your of production on the ground in Brazil because of the uh, tariff and tax policies? Yeah, that's part, that's part of the pricing or the cost of, of, of your uh, channel that just goes to the Brazilian agencies. Yeah. It doesn't... So if you can remove that, just, just like they have tax shelters here or you, you offset transfer prices for another country because of it, it, it's, the same, it's the same game. Yeah. So doing some of the, the manufacturing in-country uh, can help vendors improve their bottom line. Are there other things that vendors can do to improve their bottom line you know, and, and reducing COGS? Just, just to give you a number, uh, the import tax, for the majority of uh, health equipment is around 64 percent. Wow. So yeah. this is just the import tax. Uh, so it makes a huge difference if, if you can uh, assemble the equipment here or even uh, manufacture here. Uh, so this, I think this, this would be a, a 
uh, a very important difference. Uh, it makes a huge difference uh, in the, the, the price, yeah. the consumer price. Yeah, and, and on the, the cost of goods sold um, and getting some margins for the suppliers makes sense. So appreciate that. I'd like to get back to a point that you made, and one of the data points that we pulled up was the, the population uh, density distribution in Brazil and what a huge country it is with um, highly densely uh, uh, focused um, population centers and then a huge amount of area that has these very small rural four and five bed hospitals. Um, what's the impact and the, and the geographic cha challenges to this? You talked about how service and support is so important. I would imagine that for many, many of these small hospitals, they're difficult to get to. How can a manufacturer that has, say, capital equipment or products that need training or, or a lot of inventory turns? support those markets and and is that a significant part of the market uh, all this area with very low population density or is a, a huge portion of the healthcare spend in these large population centers like Sao Paulo, Rio and, and Salvador? I'd say that uh, um, just just for you to know there are basically 15 cities in in Brazil with more than one one million people yeah so the main expenditure it's all concentrated in the in the urban areas uh, hospitals clinics uh, uh, there we say here some uh, healthcare frontiers uh, with the Midwest and the north but uh, basically uh, the money and all the investment would be in the the densely populated areas. Yeah. So um, I, I would say to concentrate uh, on the densely uh, populated areas. For you to know, uh, the bigger uh, HMOs here, there is no national HMO. Uh, some some insurance companies are are national, have a national coverage, but. Uh, Basically, they they buy services uh, in the in the densely populated areas. So uh, all the system is concentrated uh, in the densely pop, uh, populated areas. Yeah. Uh, so so given that the the Brazilian government has has put forth a mandate and is behaving to cover everyone, does it suggest that there's an opportunity for technologies that provide better rural health care or remote health care um, and, and certainly has been talk about that in the states but it seems like there's a huge opportunity for that in Brazil or it, or is the population so dense in in these large cities that there just isn't much of a market for it in a large uh, region of Brazil um, I'll say that there's no there's not a, a huge opportunity here uh, okay. basically the mindset of, of our government today is to uh, get re-elected and... Uh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they're, they're all investing in the density pop. pop Got it. Uh, so everything course, certainly points that way. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's some problems for rural areas, but uh, it's basically to hire a doctor from abroad to go there once or twice a week, and this is uh, is not a very uh, great opportunity. Not yet, uh, anyway. Uh, okay. So, uh, we, go ahead, Eric. I was gonna say that's the way we we really um, anchored ourselves in Sao Paulo and Rio, which just those two alone in Sao Paulo alone is congested enough. Um, I think uh, Fred, they still uh, only allow cars every other day based upon license plate numbers. It's it's uh, you know there's a lot of activity just there, so we we really focused in these particular areas where we could readily service and, and gain traction, yeah. and then started to move uh, beyond that once once we had a footing with our uh, local distributors. Yeah, so let's briefly talk about the the customers and particularly the patients in the U.S. Um, 
patients are, are much more informed than they were before. Most are now getting a lot of information on the Internet. How well educated are, are customers in Brazil, both, both the physicians but also the patients that they're dealing with? And is there a lot of direct-to-consumer advertising by medical technology companies in Brazil yet? Well, well, I'll say that uh, from my from my experience, you would you would have uh, uh, like uh, a smaller portion of the population who is well educated and uh, physicians as well. Uh, they many of them study in the U.S. Uh, uh, so. I think it would be uh, the same the same knowledge uh, that your physician and and that your patient would would have in the U.S. But okay. uh, the majority of the population is uh, undereducated. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. And, and although my my direct customers are mostly the physicians and, and lab managers, sure. uh, just from the conversations with them, that I, I hear the same thing. Yeah. So. It, uh, you, you prompted a thought in my head for language. Is Brazil specific Portuguese significantly different from European Portuguese? And do companies need to keep this in mind in in whether it's their labeling, package inserts, advertising, uh, instructions, guidance? Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> yes, um, this is one of the main reasons that that the local agency takes so much time to approve. Uh, equipment and uh, um, medications. Uh, it's a long process. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's Brazil specific Portuguese. Yes, I would say so. There, uh, there are some important differences between the European Portuguese and the Brazilian Portuguese. Yeah, in the, in the technical uh, language. Uh, uh, they're not uh, 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 very different, but uh, especially some technical terms. Uh, I'll say in the healthcare area, they they would be quite different. Yeah. How about software? How important is it for um, GUIs and, and interfaces to be in uh, Portuguese rather than English? Well, this this. Uh, ab absolutely, uh, it's very important for it to be in Portuguese. Uh, I'll tell you from my experience, at, uh, we have seven hospitals. Uh, our labor force, uh, basically today here in in Brazil, we have four employment. Uh, uh, so it's very difficult to get somebody to uh, to work in the area and uh, somebody who knows English uh, like nurses and uh, technical people it's very different I, I'll yeah. say that physicians wouldn't wouldn't have uh, a lot of difficulty but uh, um, software would uh, is something that the revolution here in the health uh, healthcare system in Brazil. Everyone is using more and more. Uh, we just we just had a uh, we just purchased a, a new uh, uh, ERP, mm -hmm. and we we had a lot of difficulty because it's uh, uh, people to learn and to uh, see the the benefits of the the ERP, it's a, it's a long-term investment. Yeah. Uh, so I'd say that uh, to be in Portuguese is, is of utmost importance. Got it. Yeah, I was, I was told, uh, and I don't know if this is true, I was told by uh, our guys there that they, they look to uh, Portugal Portuguese like we look to the UK in regards to the difference in English. Yeah. It's just a, it's a little off. So it works, and, but you need to be very sensitive to it. You, you do, and everything yeah. we did software-wise is translated. Anything FDA regulated, they would look to have the translations. Now, now that I deal more with pharmaceutical and, and research labs, if you're dealing more with research uh, activities, pharma activities, that the English is okay. 
but now you're dealing with probably less FDA regulated type products and equipment and these are very well um, English spoken scientists and, and other uh, people who, who know the language quite well and so that's, that's usually passable there. But mm -hmm. I agree with Fred that in many other areas, in diagnostics in particular, orthopedics, they're looking for uh, the translations across the board. And that actually does take time, along with the registrations, along with you know, everything else that yeah. it takes to put it in there. So yeah. as far as a, a perspective, thinking about the culture there, how would you describe the technology adoption curve in Brazil? You know, how, how appealing are proven versus new technologies you know, relative to other markets? Do, do you think that uh, with the investment that's being made in technology early on, you hinted that there is a, a trend toward adopting higher quality products? When you say higher quality, is that perceived as these we were looking for proven technologies, or is there an, a significant interest in new technologies and adopting the newest and latest and greatest? I would like to uh, go ahead, Fred. Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead, Eric. I was just going to say from, from where I sit, I definitely see the interest growing. And, and it's not just with the government, as I said earlier, backing many of these uh, activities, but you see it in the, in the uh, customer base, at least my customer base. They want to have the latest and greatest. I took a trip to Brazil just a couple months ago. There are many of these uh, you know, older technologies there. and, and a lot of what they talk about is getting rid of and improving upon their existing uh, lab capabilities. Now, whether or not they have the pricing to to take that on, it, it, that's that's another part of the equation. But uh, they they definitely have the desire to get in the uh, cutting edge. Okay. So, looking at the time, I, I want to ask. Um, Really just one other question of both of you, and then we'll take a couple questions. We have a few questions from our audience that uh, I'd like to take a few minutes to address. So judging from your experience, um, just to prognosticate a little bit, let's, let's look at, say, over the next two years, after the excitement of the World Cup and, and the hangover of the Olympics wears off, um, given all the things we've discussed, can each of you give maybe two recommendations that you would suggest for manufacturers looking to provide products and services for healthcare in Brazil. Um, let's start with you, Fred. Well, I'll say that uh, uh, we are in a point of no return, right? Uh, once you've, uh, you have the uh, healthcare awareness, the benefits, you know, you know the benefits, it's, it's, it's very hard to go back. So, uh, the uh, expenditure will rise. Uh, the market, uh, healthcare market, will will grow. Uh, but then again, uh, to have a close relationship and uh, close service, to be here, to have a footprint uh, in in Brazil, it's, it would be very important. Okay. For for me, similar. It's it's you got to hit your wagon to the right relationship there. Really do your due diligence on your sales channel that you select because that can, that as you said, your first first ugh, first foot forward makes that difference. And you really want to make sure you you understand that you're you're working with a channel who's uh, maybe not necessarily exclusive to you, but really is providing you the attention and and the. Um, capabilities to get your products uh, marketed and sold. Uh, and then the service side, I, I'll say it again, just like Fred said again, you, you, you cannot um, discount how important that's going to be. So you really need to put that into the formula. And uh, you know, the nice thing about it is you know, from, from where, especially Sao Paulo sits, you know, we're looking at putting service in uh, direct uh, as opposed to the distributorship. And you can actually jump into a number of different Chile, Argentina, you know, there's some other expansions you can start doing from there once you have a, a solid footing in Brazil. So to reiterate, you get your wagon hitched to the right channel, do the due diligence, and then uh, get a strong service position. Got it. What makes a good distribution partner? Well, as I said earlier, you, you definitely, the obvious ones, you want to have uh, somebody who has the relationships with a lot of the private public organizations 
uh, anywhere from from the uh, the small labs all the way up to your uh, quest size, you know, diagnostic organizations. They have to obviously have um, FDA uh, uh, approval if you are dealing with FDA products. And I would definitely look at service capabilities. There are a number of distributors who do have engineering staff that are quite good. Uh, yeah. We use we utilize this in India and in Australia, China, a couple other places uh, for other regions. And in Brazil, you can find distributors that have a and that could be something to look at to help your cost position in, is utilizing the distribution service. It's a little bit more training, but uh, you know we we definitely look to see who's got that. And plus, when someone has a distribution uh, chain has a service component. They, they're serious about it, right? They're, they're putting the effort and the investment into not only sell products, drop and go, but to stay with that customer and build the relationship. So that's a good indication they're, they're about building the relationships. Right. Terrific. So a couple questions yeah, from, from the audience. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Fred. From my, from my experience as a provider, I totally agree with Eric. Uh, uh, we want uh, a long-term partnership. Yeah. Excellent. So a couple other questions from the audience uh, in the few minutes we have left. Let's tackle a few of those. Uh, one of the questions, uh, very straightforward, I don't know if you guys know the answers, is a question about the tax on subcomponents relative to complete assemblies. How does that compare? Do you know? You know, I don't because we never had a product that was able to be put in subcomponents and easily assembled, so we never investigated that. I do know that there are uh, a number of large competitors who were doing that in, in my last industry, so uh, I know that there's definitely a big enough difference for these uh, companies to start doing that. I can't tell you the percentage difference, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. i would say that uh, uh, last year, uh, if 60% uh, or more of the components are manufactured in Brazil, Mm -hmm. uh, the import tax would go down, I think, to 18% instead of 60%. Uh, so uh, it's called here nas nationalization of, of components. If, if they're made in Brazil, uh, the, the tax would, would decrease significantly. Yeah, that's a big jump. So uh, another question we have is, this is getting to the question of the, you know, who does a company target? Um, and the question is, how does having public reimbursement impact sales growth? Is a company better off negotiating prices with only private payers? Well, I, I can tell you that uh, the private payers, certainly when I work through the distributor chain, that, that's where you have some, you have better pricing room. I mean, certainly with, with private uh, than they did public, but uh, it, you know, usually we we would go after private care primarily. But you don't want to discount the H. You don't want to discount, I'm sorry, the public side as well because it's a large, as Fred said, it's a large part of the market. So you still don't want to discount that. But you have you have you have less price room there. Yeah. So you still need to play in the tender process uh, because that's such a big part of the market. We did, yeah. 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 Do you have any thoughts on that, Fred? Yeah, yeah. I'd say that uh, for uh, quantity, it would be definitely the public sector. Uh, and for uh, better prices, the private sector. Uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, to go through all the hurdles to sell to the public sector. Mm -hmm. And there's also the question of uh, receivables. Uh, as uh, a provider, uh, I can say from our institution that we have around uh, $100 million of receivables that are aging because the government is having some difficulty in, uh, in paying us. So it's 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 worthwhile, but it's it's a difficult relationship. Interesting. Um, another question we have, and and it's uh, specific to clinical and lab diagnostics. So so right up your alley, Eric. Uh, someone yeah. says, if you were in charge of marketing for a clinical and lab diagnostic company, 
what tactics would you prioritize to increase market share? Now, of course, it's going to be dependent on their situation, but in general, what's worked in your experience? Well, for us, it was really about, and now it's right up my alley, a, a, a few years uh, alley. As I said, I'm, I'm more on the farm and academic side now. But what really helped us in, in Brazil in the past was, and why I said hitching it to the right distributor, we, we really ensured that we had the right relationship built. And this was a distributorship that really had not necessarily ex total exclusivity, but a large portion of interest or business with what it is that we were trying to market so you had their full attention because what's important is getting in front of the customer and selling your value. Right now, I know I said pricing comes down to it, but if you can really sell it on your value and get them interested in pushing through the tender process to really kind of, I would say, mold towards your product line, I mean, that was important. But to do that, you had to have people there on the street who really believed in what you were doing 100%. So to me, the, the tactic was really making sure you did everything up front to have the right relationship. And we didn't at first. But once we did uh, get involved with a distributor chain that had the desire and the focus to uh, really not just be educated and, and regurgitate, but to really fully understand what it is that you were trying to do as an organization, I mean, that translates through. It's almost like having a direct sales force. So you have to be able to get in front of them. And it's difficult to do as far down as Brazil is. So you have, you have to have the right distribution chain. And, and of course, you've got to play. And then, then they will, assort, of course, get you into the right ad channels, the trade shows, the, the right um, everything else. Everything else spills from that, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So it's really selecting the right relationships and, and uh, sales message. At least for our pro for our product line. Yeah. So we have time for for one last question, very quickly, and, and this ties to a number of things regarding logistics that you both hinted at. Um, someone says, "How do you recommend managing forecast accuracy when you have the volatility of import lead time, the exchange rate changes, uh, the reimbursement delays that you brought up, Fred?" Um, what are your recommendations for for managing forecast accuracy, and is it even possible? <laughs> so, you want to start? You want to start, Fred? <laughs> this is a this is a huge challenge. Uh, uh, our our institution uh, is more than four hundred years old here in Brazil, we, and we can uh, we we just know one one thing. We we don't we won't. Uh, get our uh, forecast right. So yeah. This this is a huge challenge, uh, and it's it's difficult. It's, yeah. I'd say it's it's uh, one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. So it sounds I, I like have, the answer is to just have big error bars and plan accordingly, right? <laughs> Hope for the best, plan for yeah. the worst. Uh, common well, sense approach. I, I just got a dartboard on my wall here, and I throw at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that very useful point, uh, we've come to the end of our time, um, and we've learned a lot from our discussion today. Really appreciate, uh, Fred and Eric, uh, the insight that you provided to us. Thanks for your time. No problem. Thanks for having me. And Bye. on behalf of the Market Tech Group, we'd like to thank everyone for your participation. Uh, thank you also for the questions from the audience. Uh, thanks to our attendees from all across the country, and particularly we want to thank uh, Eric Hubbard and Frederico Burul. Enjoyed your you. uh, conversation and the information you provided to all of us. So after the webinar, if the attendees could just take a moment to complete the survey. Um, remember, the Market Tech Group is a medical consulting but also marketing research firm. So we really do appreciate and uh, thrive on your feedback. Good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.